Hello, this is Dr. A again, and we're going to cover the physical and chemical control of microbes. Okay, so uh, controlling microorganisms, controlling our degree of exposure to potentially harmful microbes is a monumental concern in our lives. And there's been noth nothing but truer lately where uh, with our coronavirus pandemic that we've been washing our hands like crazy and wiping down surfaces and all of that. So the methods of microbial control used outside of the body are designed to result in four possible outcomes, sterilization, disinfection, decontamination, and antisepsis. Um, inside the body, then, it would be your immune system working, right? And we're going to cover that in the immune system chapters. Okay, so um, let's look at what one of these means. So sterilization is a process that destroys or removes all viable microorganisms, including viruses, and spores, everything. It's all gone. It's all killed, okay? So uh, the term sterile should be used only in the strictest sense, okay? There's nothing uh, such as slightly sterile. It's sterile or it's not sterile, right? Um, and it's generally reserved for inanimate objects because it's impractical or in, in impossible and even harmful to try to sterilize parts of the human body. Um, and common uses are obviously for surgical instruments, syringes, and commercial, commercially packaged foods. Um, the uh, example of agents that can achieve sterilization are uh, heat via autoclave and then sterilants, which are chemicals that are capable of destroying uh, endospores. Then we have disinfection. So it is, disinfection is a physical process or a chemical agent that uh, destroys vegetative pathogens, but not endospores. Uh, it removes harmful products of the microorganisms, such as the toxins from the material. Again, normally used on inanimate objects because the concentration of the disinfectant required for effective uh, disinfection is harmful to human tissue. Uh, common uh, uses are boiling food utensils, applying a 5% bleach solution on an exam table or cleaning some toys with that, um, immersing thermometers in iodine and that kind of stuff. So bleach, iodine, and boiling heat are all the disinfectant agents. Decontamination and um, sanitization is a cleansing technique that mechanically removes microorganisms as well as other debris uh, to reduce the con contamination to safe levels. So it's just knocking the germs down. It's important to restaurants, dairies, breweries, and other commercial entities that um, handle large amounts of soil utensils and uh, containers and stuff like that. So uh, scrubbing pots and pans and wiping down counters and stuff like that would be decontamination, sanitization. Uh, the common uses are going to be, again, for cooking utensils, uh, dishes, bottles, and um, uh, cans. Uh, all of those things can be sanitized before they need to be reused. Um, they use soaps, detergents, and um, commercial dishwashers, which are really hot. Uh, can all decontaminate or sanitize uh, objects. And then antisepsis and dedromation. Uh, this just reduces the number of microbes on the human skin. It's a form of de decontamination, but for living tissues. So that's the difference between uh, washing your hands and scrubbing the pots and pans, if you will. Scrubbing pots and pans would be decontamination or sanitization, whereas dedromation would be washing your hands or antisepsis could be uh, cleaning a surface, uh, a skin with alcohol. Okay, so uh, let's break down these microbial control methods and then we'll look at each of those. So you can use physical agents, so that would be heat and radiation. So um, heat can be dry heat or moist heat. So dry heat would be um, either incineration, so like a fire, um, or cremation as a form of incineration, um, or a dry oven, which then more is uh, like dehydrates stuff, right? So uh, dry heat for the appropriate amount of time can achieve sterilization. Moist heat, then you have steam under pressure, uh, which is um, autoclaving, that can achieve sterilization. 
but then boiling water, hot water, and pasteurization will achieve disinfection. Then radiation as a physical agent, so you have ionizing and non-ionizing radi radiation. Ionizing radiations are your x-rays and your gamma rays and stuff. They can make stuff sterile. They're also uh, dangerous and harmful to the human body. And your non-ionizing radiation, such as UV radiation, uh, will achieve disinfection. So we're right here. We've done physical, heat, dry, moist, radiation, ionizing, non-ionizing. So now let's look at chemical agents. We have gases and liquids. Uh, of the gases, some can achieve sterilization, some can achieve disinfection. And on the liquids, uh, if used on animate objects, so on your skin, you get antisepsis, so whether you like washing your hands or again, using Germex or something like that, or Purell. And then if you use liquids on inanimate objects, um, such again uh, as um, surgical instruments or um, pots and pans and stuff like that, you can achieve disinfection, but you can achieve sterilization also depending on the method that you use. Um, in the end of uh, the mechanical removal methods, we have filtration and you can fil um, filter air or liquids. Um, when you filter a liquid, you can achieve sterilization and uh, filtering air only achieves decontamination. Again, the, your um, definitions of each of disinfection, sterilization, antisepsis, and decontamination are all right there. Okay, so let's look at the relative resistance of microbial forms. So the primary targets of your microbial control are going to be the microorganisms that can cause infections um, in the human body or spoilage in the environment or um, in food and stuff like that. The uh, targeted population often contains a mixture of microbes, so it's never just one. It's a community of uh, various microbes that in can include bacteria, viruses, fungi, etc and have extreme differences in resistance and harmfulness. The bacterial endospores have traditionally been considered the most resistant microbial entities and the hardest to kill. So um, if you remember in your bacterial uh, lesson, the um, C. diff and is uh, definitely uh, a form of those because they, uh, Clostridium forms endospore and they can be really, really hard to kill. So uh, basically, any process that can kill an endospore will invariably kill all the less resistant microbial forms. So that's going to be kind of a, a standard that we're going to look at. So of the microorganisms, um, the most resistant are prions, which prions are not actually microorganisms. They're infectious uh, proteins that can cause um, disease, such as uh, crossfelt Jacob disease and uh, mad cow disease. Next are the bacterial endospores in their spore form, of course. Next are macrobacterium. So these are the bacteria that form TB. They have kind of a waxy uh, cell wall and stuff, so it's a little bit harder to kill. Then we have staph and pseudomonas right there. They're quite hard to kill. Uh, then your protozoan cysts. Again, remember cysts are there to resist drying and stuff. Then your protozoan trophozoites. Then most gram-negative bacteria. Then you have your fungi and fungal spores. Then you have non-enveloped viruses, most gram-positive bacteria, and then you have enveloped viruses. So enveloped viruses are the least resistant of all of these. And um, on a side note again, that is a good news because the coronavirus is an enveloped virus. So it is um, very easy to kill it if you wash your hands and stuff like that in uh, clean surfaces. Okay, so let's look at a case. We're going to talk about this for a minute. So a 62-year-old diabetic black man presents to the emergency room with a swollen left leg with areas of blanching and blue mottling. A foul odor is coming from a dressed wound. The physicians removed a dressing and a brownish fluid is seeping from a wounded area. The fluid contains what appears to be small bits of the tissue. Yuck. No pus appears to be present. Um, the wound has a strong rotten odor. Five days earlier, while at his work as a farmer, he caught the leg in his manure spreader, sustaining, uh, sustaining a deep, crushing, grossly dirty injury. His wife cleaned the wound as well as she could with soap and water, dressed it with a clean gauze, and wrapped it tightly with an elastic bandage to stop the bleeding. The second day, they redressed the wound and applied triple antibiotic ointments. This is all good care, right? The patient treated his pain with ibuprofen or Advil. 
He reported the pain was not very bad for the first 72 hours. In the past 24 hours, however, the leg has uh, swelled and the mottling began to appear. A foul odor and severe pain accompanied the swelling. Uh, his wife convinced him to come to the ER, even though they do not have medical insurance. And so this is what model and swelling, this is what it would look like. Okay, so um, first, do you know which one uh, it might cause this? So there will, all, they're all of uh, the um, species of Clostridium, but different genera. So we have Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism. Clostridium difficile, which causes C. diff diarrhea. We have Clostridium perfringens, which causes gas gangrene. And we have Clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus. So take a guess at which one do you think. And we're going to cover all of these. Now, Clostridium, they, these all, because they're Clostridium, make endospores. Okay, so he has gas gangrene caused by Clostridium perfringens. So the foul odor, the swelling of the leg and all of that, um, these endospores uh, live in dirt and manure and all of that. So um, having a, a wound that was deep, uh, often these guys can get in and uh, live anaerobically and again, create uh, the gas that uh, causes tissue to die and stuff and it's, it can be pretty bad. So is a gram uh, positive rod like this and it forms endospores okay so why is it not tetanus because that would probably give me the next most guessed answer because uh, anybody who's stepped on a rusted nail has probably done gum had to have a tetanus shot and they uh, they likely gave a, him a tetanus shot in the er just to make sure but um clostridium tetani if it gets into the wound it uh, creates a toxin, it secretes a toxin, which the, uh, is the tetanus toxin. And the tetanus toxin goes and binds on some of these receptors and it causes uh, muscle contraction that just will not relax. So it can cause lockjaw, but uh, so it causes what we call a tetanic contraction and that's where it gets the name tetani. Uh, so a, a clenched type of contraction. So this baby has has tetanus and basically I know they have a hand there, hand there, but it's it's straight as a board, completely um, clenched and stuff uh, with all the muscles contracted from that uh, toxin from Clostridium tetani. Uh, and then botulinum, uh, Clostridium botulinum causing, causing botulism, it also causes a form of paralysis except this one is a flaccid paralysis. Uh, it is often associated with improperly canned vegetables, so you would ingest it, um, and uh, it causes the muscles to relax and not be able to contract, so you can have double vision, problems swallowing, problem talking, nausea, vomiting, tachycardia, and all kinds of stuff like that. So obviously these did not also uh, match the signs and symptoms that the patient had. And then your last one, Clostridium difficile, which causes just rip-roaring diarrhea, which is nasty. Um, and um, we've talked about this one already a little bit, but um, they have these endospores that can survive uh, the acidity of the stomach and reach a large intestine. It can all survive outside. Uh, and it's normally post a course of antibiotics. Uh, they then flourish in the colon and start damaging the lining of the colon and uh, it is the most common cause of uh, nosocomial diarrhea. So this is diarrhea that has been acquired in a hospital and you can get pseudomembranous colitis. Uh, and the, the signs and symptoms are fever, crampy abdominal pain and diarrhea. Okay, so let's talk about endospore resistance. So to give you a comparison between endospores here in the vegetative forms, which would be the, the actively dividing forms. So if you use moist heat for an endospore, you would have to use 120 degrees Celsius, whereas a vegetative form would die at 80. So it's 1.53 times more resistant the endospore is. Radiation, it takes 4,000 gamma rays versus 1,000. 
sterilizing gas which has ethylene oxide it, it takes 1200 milligrams per liter instead of 700 milligrams per liter in a sporicidal liquid such as 2% glutaldehyde it takes three hours of exposure to it versus 10 minutes that's 183 times more resistant for the endospore. So if it can kill an endospore, it can kill a vegetative form. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about agents versus processes. So sterilization and disinfection are processes. So processes are things that you do, right? Um, and then agents are like chemicals or, um, you know, uh, physical agents would be like heat or, or um you know, moisture, dry heat, and stuff like that. So uh, let's look at some terms. So something that's bactericide uh, or bactericidal is a chemical can then destroy the bacteria, uh, except for endospores. In order for it to kill an endospore, it has to be sporicidal or sporicide. Uh, a fungicide is a chemical that can kill fungal spores, and a viricide is a chemical that can inactivate viruses. Um, and a germicide or microbicide is a general term for a chemical agent that can kill microorganisms. So it refers to kind of all of it. So if it's bactericidal, fungicidal, virucidal, and sporicidal, then it is a germicidal or microbicidal chemical. Um, sepsis versus asepsis. So sepsis is a growth of microorganisms in the blood and other tissues. So that's uh, an indication of infection and all of that. And asepsis is what we do to avoid in causing sepsis in our patients. So an aseptic technique is any practice that prevents the entry of infectious agent into sterile tissues and thus prevents infection. An aseptic technique is, a, is practiced in healthcare and range from sterile methods to antisepsis. Uh, so antisepsis would be applying things like um, alcohol or chlorhexidine or something like that um, to, to a surface area of a, like a skin and stuff before you uh, inserted an IV needle in there and put an IV in. Um, it's also wearing gloves. It's you know you, you know having clean hands and sterile gloves and stuff like that. It's all the procedure and technique that you use to insert a catheter without causing uh, or in, without introducing any kind of bacteria in there. So um, antiseptics are chemical agents that are applied directly to exposed body surfaces such as skin and mucous membranes can be applied to wounds and surgical incisions to prevent the vegetative pathogens from growing. Those are antiseptics. Uh, they can be used for preparing the skin before surgical incision with iodine compounds, for example. Um, swab in an open root canal with hydrogen peroxide, that's another antiseptic, or just ordinary hand washing with a germicidal soap it is also a form of antiseptics. Okay, so the use of iodine compounds to prepare the skin for surgery would be, pick one of these, which one do you think it is? If you're not sure, go back and look at your definitions. Stasis and static mean stand still. So something that's bacteriostatic is a chemical agent that will prevent the growth of bacterial tissues on tissues or objects in the environment. So it prevents the growth. It doesn't specifically kill it. So uh, for it to kill it, it has to say sidle, right? If it's bacteriocidal, like think suicidal, homicidal, bacteriocidal, it will kill it, right? If it's bacteriostatic, it just stops it from growing, uh, which then of course is helpful because you don't get them multiplying. Fungistatic, fungistatic is a chemical that will inhibit fungal growth. Um, antiseptics and drugs also often have what we call microbiostatic effects uh, because microbicidal compounds are toxic to human cells and they would destroy our cells and that would just completely defeat the purpose, right? Because it would just kill you. Uh, so, but even a sidle agent doesn't necessarily result in sterilization. It all depends on how it's used. You have to be to, in order for it to be, um, uh, to achieve sterilization, you have to uh, follow the right protocol, the right concentration, the right exposure time, etc. So uh, critical medical devices, so let's look at some practical matters here, um, are expected to come into contact with sterile tissues 
and they must be sterilized for use. So an example of that would be a pacemaker. So there's a critical medical device is going to, going to go into a sterile area. It has to be sterilized before use. Semi-critical devices come into contact with mucosal membranes. They must, must receive high level disinfection. So anything that would go in, go down here in, you know, in contact with mucous membranes and stuff like that, or, you know, up a urethra or something like that, uh, or semi-critical. And non-critical devices, they do not touch the patient or they only touch intact skin and they require only low level disinfection. That would be, for example, I don't know, a blood pressure cuff would be a non-critical device. So um, match uh, the device, whether it is semi-critical, non-critical or critical and pretty easy to do that. So uh, substances that require sterilization would be um, anywhere from durable solids to sensitive liquids. So durable means lasting. So think um, metal scalpels and stuff like that. Uh, sensitive liquids are uh, liquids that need to be sterilized um, because, um, yeah, they, they might be used in the human body and stuff like that. So stu situation requiring sterilization do confront persons involved in healthcare all the time, especially if you work or involved in uh, surgical processes, but really, really in any kind of healthcare process, uh, there is this concern with sterilizing the, the right things. So consideration for using the sterilization procedure is going to be the cost, the effectiveness, and the method of disposal afterwards. Uh, either the method of disposal of the sterilant once it's been used, um, and you know, like how it, how is it a, a biohazard that has to have special removal methods, and does it cost a lot to the hospital, etc. Okay, so what is microbial death? So uh, death is a permanent termination of an organism's vital processes. So uh, it can't make more, it can't duplicate, it, it can't survive, right? But the thing is, is when you look at a little bacteria or a little fungi, like how do you do in the little suckers alive, right? Because you can't assess its breathing or its heart rate or anything like that. You like you put on a human. So death is difficult to determine. So what uh, they have decided is uh, microbial death is a permanent loss of the reproductive capability, even under optimal growth conditions. So that is the accepted uh, definition of uh, microbiological death. So basically, the way you would do this um, to, to figure this out is, let's say you had a surface that you were trying to sterilize, or let's see a scalpel or something like that. And um, you, you submitted it, you, you subjected it to the uh, sterilization process according to protocol and all of that, and you wanted to check if it worked, what you would do is you would take a sterile swab, swab the object, and then plate it on a, an auger plate and give it all the food it would need, so that's contained in the auger plate, put it on an optimal environment, which would be body temperature, let it incubate for an adequate amount of time and if you have no growth on that plate then you uh, it is a way to check that you achieve sterilization okay um the death of the whole population is not instantaneous so remember it's not just a single bacteria usually on that's contaminated something's a mix of different different types of bacteria fungi viruses and stuff like that so uh, the death begins when a certain threshold of a microbicidal agent is met, right? Um, we have to have a certain strength for a certain amount of time. And death will continue in a logarithmic manner, so again, doubling over time, as time or concentration is increased. So the longer you leave it in contact uh, with the microbicidal agent, the, the faster death happens, or the more concentrated it is, the faster faster the death happens. Active cells tend to die more quickly than less active cells. So that's why it's so hard to kill um, cysts and spores because they're not active. And eventually a point is reached at which survival of any cell is highly unlikely. At that point is the point that's equivalent to sterilization. 
So what affects death rate? Uh, so we have one, the number of microbes. A higher load of contaminants will take longer to destroy. So the dirtier it is, the harder it is going to be to get it sterile or clean. Um, the nature of the microorganisms in the population. So again, it's usually a mixture of bacteria, fungi, spores, and viruses, the spores being the hardest to kill. And then the temperature and pH of the environment uh, also affects how uh, the microbicidal agent is working. Um, some work better at hotter temperatures and stuff. Um, some are affected by pH, so those definitely can make a difference. Um, concentration, so the dose and intensity of the agent. So, uh, for example, UV radiation is more effective at 260 nanometers, and most disinfectants are more active at higher concentrations. So, for example, if you took bleach and you did a 50% bleach solution, it would kill things faster than a 5% bleach solution. And uh, the mode of action of the agent. So how does the agent kill the microorganism? Um, it, does it uh, completely, uh, does it like destroy the cell wall? Does it destroy the proteins? And you know, we're gonna look at that here in just a minute. And um, the presence of solvents or interfering organic matter or inhibitors. So things that could counter the action of the microbicidal compound. Uh, organic matter would be, for example, if you had a C. diff patient and they had diarrhea all over the place, then uh, removing the feces is gonna be your first uh, thing because that's organic material. Uh, so you have to be able to remove all of that before you can even start technically cleaning uh, and trying to uh, decontaminate the uh, area. So saliva, blood, feces, all can inhibit the action of disinfectants and even the action of heat. So if you look on um, some of your cleaning agents, even those those cleaning wipes that look like baby wipes, you will you'll see on the instructions it says first clean off like so the blood the feces so first remove those or you know organic matter and stuff then once you think it's clean you think you got all that then get another one and wipe again and then uh that you know after a certain amount of time that can uh achieve some some form of sanitization here so uh your antimicrobials then have a, a range of cellular targets that allows them to have actions so the least selective agents can tend to be effective against a widest range of microbes so like heat and radiation it just destroys stuff period which is why you can't use it on the body because it would destroy our cells too um, and then selective agents target only a single cellular component such as like uh, drugs your uh, uh, which we're going to talk about in the next lesson so what are those uh, uh, cellular targets? We, um, the um, agents can target the cell wall, the cell membrane, cellular synthetic processes, so like a building of uh, the building of the cell wall or, or of how it eats and how it metabolizes stuff. Um, and it can also target uh, proteins that are essential for its survival in uh, destroying them. So uh, if the cellular target is the cell wall, the chemical agents can damage the cell wall by either blocking its synthesis or digesting the cell wall. Things that can do that are chemicals, detergents, and alcohols. Uh, if it targets the cytoplasmic membrane, um, they can physically bind to the lipid layer and poke holes in it, allowing the, the liquid to come in or the ions and stuff to exit so like the detergent can reach in to the cells so these are soap detergents do that um, the ones that mess with cellular synthesis are agents can that can interrupt the synthesis of proteins uh, metabolism um, you know while well, mess up the protein are needed for metabolism and it prevents multiplication of the bacteria uh, and our agents can also change the genetic code, ca causing mutations. So that would be formaldehyde, radiation, and ethylene oxide. And those things are all dangerous to use. So formaldehyde, for example, is uh, known to be a carcinogenic because it will alter your DNA too. And then uh, the ones that interfere with proteins, so they can denature proteins. So uh, breaking the protein bonds, which causes the breakdown of the protein structure, which causes it to not function the way it's supposed to um, and then some can attach to the active side of a protein preventing it from interactive 
interacting with its chemicals that it's supposed to inter interact with and therefore making it useless. Um, moist heat alcohols and phenolics are all uh, agents that interfere with proteins. So let's first look at uh, physical control using heat. So elevated tem temperatures are microbicidal that will kill bacteria. Lower temperatures are microbostatic. Um, and um, moist heat, uh, so you have hot water, boiling water, or steam between 60 and 135 degrees Celsius. And then dry heat, you have hot air uh, or an open flame, which can range anywhere from 160 degrees Celsius. Uh, that would be hot air to thousands of degrees Celsius. That would be an open flame. So uh, moist heat will operate at lower temperatures and shorter exposure times to achieve the same effect as dry heat, so it's faster. And it's even faster if you put pressure on it. And uh, the microbicidal effect is the coagulation and denaturation of the proteins. Uh, so it changes the protein shapes and stuff. Uh, dry heat uh, dehydrates the cell. So it removes water that's necessary for the met metabolic uh, reactions. It denatures, de denatures the proteins. Um, it can increase the stability of some protein conformation, which then uh, means it requires higher temperatures to kill those or to, to destabilize those proteins and kill those microorganisms. At very high temperature, though, uh, it oxidizes the cells and burns them to ashes. So that would be like cremation and stuff. So a little bit of comparison of times and temperatures to achieve sterilization with moist and dry heat. So with moist heat at 121 degrees Celsius, it takes 15 minutes to sterilize. With dry heat at 121 degrees uh, Celsius, it takes 600 minutes or 10 hours to sterilize. 121 degrees is 21 degrees above boiling, right? So it's quite high. Obviously here, if you up to temperature, you can shorten the time. And same thing here, if you up to temperature, you can shorten the time. Okay, so uh, bacterial endospores exhibit the greatest resistance to heat and thermal death. Uh, the destruction of the spores usually requires temperatures above, above boiling and resistance varies between species. Your vegetative cells vary in sensitivity to heat, and the death times can vary from 50 uh, Celsius for three minutes to 60 Celsius for 60 minutes. So again, endospores and vegetative cells. Vegetative cells of the spore formers have the same susceptibility to, he to heat as vegetative cells of non-spore formers. So uh, yeah, it's just because it's from a spore former, if, as long if it's not in the spore form, it is uh, sensitive, more sensitive to being killed. Pathogens have the same susceptibility to heat as non-pathogens. Fungi, protozoa, and worms are similar in their sensitivity to heat. And viruses, viruses are resistant to heat and uh, their tolerance can extend from 55 Celsius for two to five minutes to 60 degrees Celsius for 600 minutes, which is 10 hours. All right, give it a second, this thing will catch up here. Come on. Sure, sorry, let's try this again. Here we go. So uh, thermal death measurement. So your thermal death time is the shortest, shortest length of time required to kill all your test microbes at a specific temperature. Okay, so it's how long is the time at a set temperature, okay? The thermal death point is the lowest temperature required to kill all microbes in 10 minutes. So this time is the temperature that's variable. The amount of time is set to 10 minutes. Okay, and uh, the heat treatment of perishable substances must render the product free of the agents of spoilage or disease without affecting the speed and cost of processing, but also the taste of the product. So we're talking about, uh, well, perishable substances, uh, things like antibiotics, you're probably not as worried about the taste, but things like uh, beer and uh, wine and uh you know, milk and apple juice and stuff like that, you definitely are concerned about the taste also. 
So uh, the moist heat methods, we have boiling, which can, uh, boiling water can achieve disinfection. So uh, sometimes there's boil water orders and those are meant to destroy bacteria and stuff. Um, so again, um, usually uh, you want to, for water to boil, you have to achieve 100 degrees Celsius or higher. Uh, this is really good for um, disinfecting um, baby bottles and stuff like that. Um, for uh, disinfecting water, food and utensils, uh, bedding, and stuff like that. So boiling is uh, a good moist heat method. Pasteurization uh, is for the disinfection of beverages. So uh, again, in pasteurization, it uh, uses a lower temperature. And so uh, you can do 71.6 Celsius for 15 seconds or somewhere in between around 65 Celsius for 30 minutes um, by batches and stuff. And so um, there's, you know, uh, the, the, the higher heat with a short amount of time seems to be better. Uh, and each, you know, manufacturer just determines what uh, they can do. And then that, of course, extends the life of the product and keeps it from spoiling so fast. This is autoclaving. So autoclaving is moist heat so it's steam under pressure uh, and that can uh, you can sterilize stuff like that so for example uh, if you were to uh, prepare some auger or media and stuff you want to make sure that it's sterile but you know because you don't want to introduce other bacteria into your uh, plate because you know you're using it to to grow specific kinds of bacteria so um, you would put your your auger flask of auger and stuff in here in the autoclave and then uh, run pressure in steam 120 degrees celsius steam for a certain amount of time usually 15 minutes and it will sterilize everything that is in there i'll see nugget back there yeah nugget is right there all right, incineration uh, is, uh, so burning stuff, all right, in the micro, uh, microbiology lab, um, the, if you have a Bunsen burner in a, a metal loop, if you flame the loop through the, uh, you know, through the flame and it gets red hot, that sterilizes that loop. Uh, and then, but of course, it you know, incineration, unless you're talking about a metal or something like that, usually destroys whatever it is you're trying to, um, disinfect or sterilize or whatever the hot air oven um, so it's another method uh, for heat sterilization it just takes longer uh, and the temperatures are lower of course than incineration so then we'll look at cold and desiccation so desiccation is drying so uh, the principal benefit of a cold treatment is uh, to slow the growth of cultures and microbes in food during processing and storage, which is why you put stuff in the refrigerator. You know that if you leave it at room temperature, it will spoil faster than if you put it in the refrigerator. But basically, it only slows down the activities of most microbes. And so things can still grow. And there are some microbes that can grow at refrigerator temperatures. So uh, most microbes are not adversely affected by gradual gradual cooling, long-term refrigeration, or deep freezing. So if it's in there and you freeze it, you're not going to kill it. Uh, if you refrigerate it, you're not going to kill it either. Temperatures from negative 70 Celsius to negative 135 Celsius can be used to preserve cultures of bacteria, viruses, and fungi for long periods. So we're talking about decades. So um, the CDC stores uh, all of their cultures like that frozen at these extremely low temperatures. And you can re, you know, if you warm them up, you can just reactivate them and use them. Uh, desiccation, so drying, uh, the vegetative cells directly exposed to normal room temperature gradually no, become dehydrated because they, they lose moisture. Um, some microbes are killed by desiccation. On others, desiccation has no effect, especially uh, things, spores and cysts and all of that because they're meant to resist drying. And then lyophilization is a combination of freezing and drying. So it's what we call freeze-dried. Um, and it's a method of preserving microorganisms and other things. Um, and it, for microorganisms, they'll remain in a viable state because you freeze them, which suspends animation. And then the fact that you, you dry them, it prevents water crystals from forming, which the water crystals could destroy the cells. So 
Um, if you have uh, pure stock cultures, they're frozen instantaneously and exposed to a vacuum that removes the water, that avoids the formation of ice crystals, and then you can keep them like literally forever that way. Uh, radiation is our uh, next method. So, um, you know, moving away from heat, uh, from the physical one. Uh, well, it's a physical one, moving away from heat and cold. So it's our, our next physical one. Um, it's radiation is energy em emitted from uh, atomic activities. So as like uh, electrons come off of atoms and stuff. Um, and it's, this energy is dispersed at high velocity throughout matter or space. So you think they're talking about gamma rays, x-rays, and ultraviolet radiation. Uh, and these got, these things damage DNA, which is how it kills, uh, you know, and, and activates viruses and kills bacteria and fungi. But of course, it also damages our DNA. So you have to protect yourself against gamma rays and radiations and stuff and x-rays. So if you look at the electromagnetic radiation spectrum from uh, bigger waves to shorter waves with increasing energy here, so these big uh, frequency waves are radio waves, then we go to microwaves, then we go to infrared, then we are here in the spectrum of visible light. We've got the red spectrum here at 750 nanometers to orange, to yellow, to green, blue, into violet at 380, and then from violet you cross over to ultraviolet radiation, then x-rays, and then gamma rays. Um, next method is filtration. So filtration is effective uh, to remove microns from airs and air and liquids. So the fluid is strained through a filter with openings that are large enough for the fluid to pass, but too small for the microbes to pass. Uh, you can also use thin membranes of cellulose, acetate, polycarbonate, and plastics so whose pore size is carefully controlled. Charcoal, diatomaceous earth, earth, and unglazed porcelain can also be used in filters, and the pore size can be controlled to permit true sterilization by trapping viruses in large proteins. So filtration is used to prepare liquids that cannot withstand heat, such as serum, blood, products, vaccines, drugs, um, IV fluids, enzymes, and media. And uh, al an alternative method for decontaminating milk and beer um, is filtration because it doesn't alter the flavor. Um, it is an important step in water purification. And it is unable to remove some molecules like toxins that can cause disease. Uh, because they are smaller than the pore size. Um, high efficiency particulate air or HEPA filters are used in hospital rooms and sterile rooms to filter the air. And so here it is the idea of pore size. So you have the filter here and the, the pore size allows the molecules of water, the liquid to flow through but uh, bigger molecules uh, in uh, cells such as bacterial cells and all of that are left behind uh, and it can't enter and so uh, you can use a vacuum and all that to suck the liquid and then your sterilized liquid will be here. Uh, so here's a representation of the pore size versus the bacteria size. Then osmotic pressure, um, so let's talk about that. So adding large amount of salt or sugar to food creates a hypertonic environment for bacteria. Uh, so it basically it pulls the water out of the bacteria, which causes them to explode. Um, and so this is pickling, smoke, smoking, and drying foods. And uh, those have been used for centuries to preserve food uh, to keep bacteria from you know, breaking it down and making it spoil bacteria and fungi and all of that. Uh, so osmotic pressure is never going to be a sterilizing technique. And uh, so these are physical controls. Uh, which one would be used to sterilize the following item? So basically you're trying to match the item to uh, like a vaccine to the type uh, like radiation oven or something like that. There you go. So you've got four to match up. So now let's dive into the chemical agents. So uh, chemical agents occur in liquid, gaseous, gaseous or solid state. Um, they can range from disinfectants and antiseptics to sterilants and preservatives. Um, an aqueous solution is a chemical dissolved, dissolved in pure water as the solvent, and a tincture is a chemical dissolved in pure alcohol or a water-alcohol mixture. 
So uh, selecting a microbicidal chemical. So you're, let's go through all of the what all what we would like in an ideal microbicidal chemical. So we would like rapid action, even in low concentrations. We would like it to be soluble in water or alcohol and stable long term. Have a broad spectrum of action without being toxic to human and animal tissues. We would like for it to have penetration of inanimate surfaces to sustain accumulative or persistent action. And we would like to see resistance to becoming inactivated by organic matter, such as like blood and feces. We would love for it to be non-corrosive and non-staining, have sanitizing and deodorizing properties, and affordable, it's affordable and readily available. So that's all the the criteria for an ideal one. So the ones that checks the most of these boxes are going to be glutaraldehyde and hydrogen peroxide. Those both approach this ideal. So uh, germicides are evaluated in terms of their effectiveness in destroying microbes in medical and dental settings. So your high level germicides will kill endospores and can be used as sterilants. Your intermediate level germicides will kill fungal, but not bacterial spores. They will kill resistant pathogens and viruses. And your low level germicides will eliminate only vegetative bacteria, vegetative fungal cells and like viruses. Um, factors that affect the germicidal activity of chemicals. So one, you have the nature of the microorganism being treated. Are we dealing with spores? Are we dealing with vegetative cells or mixture? Like what's going on? The nature of the material being treated. So is it um, like human, human, is it skin? Is it human tissue? Is it something metallic? Is it something plastic? Would it melt? Would it uh, react with the, you know, the chemical and stuff like that? Is it, you know, inert or not? Um, you know, what is it? Is it, is it um, a fabric of some sort? Uh, the degree of contamination. So is it something that's just like covered in blood and stuff or is it pretty clean? The time of exposure. So how long it's exposed to the uh, chemical and the strength and chemical action, of course, of the germicide itself. So uh, chemical strength or concentration. So dilutions are uh, what you do when you take a small volume of the liquid and then you add a, a solvent to it, such as water or alcohol, um, and um, to achieve a certain ratio. So uh, sometimes uh, dilutions are, um, so given a specific ratio, you could see mix one part bleach to, uh, you know, five parts water and, you know, you get a one to six dilution. Um, so one six dilution there. Um, so I said one part to five. So if it's one part, um, one part of the chemical to like five parts of the water, that six part total, that would be a one sixth dilution or in one to six dilution. So um, the parts per million is used uh, for solutions such as chlorine that are effective in very diluted concentrations. And percentage solutions are um, when a solute is added by uh, to water by weight of volume. Okay, so the next factor that affects the germicidal activity of chemicals is the length of exposure. So most compounds require an adequate contact time to allow the chemical to penetrate and act on the microbes that are present. So it's very important that you follow the directions. If it takes 10 minutes, you have to give it 10 minutes. If it gets 30 minutes, you have to give it 30 minutes, right? Uh, the composition of the material being treated. So uh, smooth solid objects are more reliably disinfected than those that have uh, pores or pockets. Large amount of organic material can hinder the penetration, of course, and adequate cleaning of the instruments and other reusable ma materials must precede the use of a germicide or sterilant. So you would actually decontaminate them first, scrub them and all that kind of stuff, and then you would try to sterilize them. Get this going here. Okay, so let's look at certain chemical ones. So we have your halogens, we have chloride. Um, chloride, such as bleach, can kill endospores slowly and kills all of the microbes. Uh, so you think you need a liquid or gaseous chlorine. 
uh, hypochlorites or chloramines. Um, in solution, these compounds combine with water and release hypochlorous acid, and which denatures enzymes and permanently or suspends uh, or and permanently uh, denatures enzyme permanently and suspends metabolic enzymes. Sorry, I can't read apparently. Um, it is less effective if ex exposed to light, alkaline pH, and uh, excess organic matter. So, just in case you didn't know, uh, if you put bleach in um, a glass or see glass bottle or see through container of some sort where light can penetrate it. Uh, the light will inactivate the bleach pretty quickly. So uh, you won't always want to keep it in opaque containers or um, protect it from light. Um, so your um, halogens such as iodine can kill endospore slowly and all the other microbes. Uh, so we have free iodine in solutions and then your um, iodophores, uh, which are complexes of iodine and alcohol. So uh, it penetrates the cells of microorganisms where it interferes with a bunch of metabolic functions. So you have 2% iodine, 5% um, uh, iodine, and iodophore products. So you're thinking like your betadines and all of those. Um, and they can be um, extremely irritant and, to the skin, and um, they can be toxic also when absorbed. So your iodine stuff here are... Um, Part of those. Okay. Moving on to hydrogen peroxide. So um, it kills um, in, uh, endospores and all other microorganisms. It is color colorless but caustic. Um, it decomposes in the presence of light also, so that's why it's always in dark containers. Um, and um, certain uh, metals and uh, catalase also uh, yeah, water and oxygen gas and all of that. So uh, it is used as an antiseptic. 3% hydrogen peroxide is used for skin and wound cleansing. So that's the one you can just buy at the store, right? Uh, but 35% hydrogen peroxide is used in low temperature as sterilizing uh, in the sterilizing cabinet for delicate instruments. Uh, that is not the kind that you can buy at the store. Uh, and it's only sporicidal in high concentration. But hydrogen peroxide, so it's a good, cheap disinfectant that you should keep at your house. Your aldehydes can kill endospores and all other microbes. Um, and you have glutaraldehyde and formaldehyde in that group. Uh, glutaraldehyde kills rapidly in its broad spectrum. Uh, it can be used to sterilize respiratory equipment, scopes, uh, kidney dialysis machines, and dental instruments. Formaldehyde kills more slowly, um, but it can be used to disinfect surgical instruments. Um, but glutaraldehyde is unstable, um, especially if you uh, increase the pH and temperature. Formaldehyde is extremely toxic uh, and is irritating uh, to the skin and mucous membranes, and it can cause cancers and stuff. So, your uh, gaseous sterilants and disinfectants, uh, that's ethylene oxide. It kills endospores, and um, other gases are less effective. So, um, so it's a colorless substance um, that exists as a gas at room temperature. But the problem with ethylene oxide is that it is explosive. So um, it has to be uh, um, combined with a high percentage of carbon dioxide or fluorocarbon. Uh, it can damage the lungs, eyes, and mucous membranes. Um, and uh, it is a carcinogen also. So next, we have our phenols, like car uh, carbolic acid. Um, some, they will kill some bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Uh, and uh, they're derived from cold tar, but they're toxic, uh, which makes them dangerous to use as antiseptics. Uh, they are um, standard against um, um, other less toxic phenol uh, phenolic disinfections. Um, the phenols uh, coefficient quantitatively compares chemicals and antimicrobial properties uh, to those in phenol. Uh, so again, it is now used only in certain limited cases, uh, such as in drains and cesspools um, in animal quarters. So it's just it's kind of a dangerous one. It's just toxic. Just stay away from it. Chlorhexidine, that's used a lot, uh, kills uh, most bacteria, viruses, and fungi. 
um, and um, targets both bacterial membranes um, where selective permeability is lost, um, so it re uh, results in denaturation of proteins also. Um, it's mild and low toxicity and has a rapid action, so it's a very popular choice and is used in hand scrubs, prepping the skin for surgery as an obstetric antiseptic and a uh, um, mucous membrane uh, irrigant, etc. cetera. Uh, so again, the, the effect on certain viruses and fungi is variable for chlorhexidine. And then we have alcohol, so this is just rubbing alcohol, so like ethyl or isopropyl alcohol. Uh, kills most bacteria, fungus, uh, in viruses and fungi. Um, concentration of 50% in higher dissolved membrane lipids disrupt cell surface tension and compromise membrane integrity. Uh, so it's germicidal, non-irritating, and inexpensive, um, and it's routinely used as a skin de-germing uh, agent. So 70% or 95% solutions of alcohol. And the rate of evaporation decreases its effectiveness, right? And um, so uh, this one has been used a lot. It's uh, also the base in a lot of your uh, Purell hand sanitizers and stuff. And then your detergents uh, kill some bacteria, viruses, uh, and fungi. So those are like soaps, if you will. Um, there are polar uh, molecules that act as uh, surfactants, so they can poke holes in cell membranes and stuff. Uh, they're effective against, again, viruses, algae, fungi, and gram-positive bacteria. Um, and they're a low-level disinfection for in the clinical setting, uh, used in, uh, used to clean restaurants, utensils, dairy equipment, uh, surfaces, and restrooms and stuff like that. So it is ineffective against TB, hepatitis, pseudomonas, and endospores. And uh, the activity is greatly reduced in the presence of organic matter. Sorry, the dogs start barking. All right, and then we have heavy metal compounds. Um, again, kill some bacteria, viruses, and fungi. So that would be like mercury, silver, and other metals. Uh, they have a microbial effects uh, by binding onto uh, functional groups of proteins and, and activating them. So we have organic mercury um, and silver nitrates and stuff like that. So uh, microbes can develop resistance to metals. They are not effective against endospores. Uh, they can be toxic if inhaled, ingested, or absorbed. And there are many people have allergic reactions to those. OK, so next you have a poll. Which of the following antimicrobial chemicals would be a sterilizing agent? Okay, and uh, this last slide here says if you have a question, and that wraps up our lecture then on physical and chemical controls.